All right, we're going to start chapter 13 in 157. So chapter 13 deals with the brain and also the cranial nerves. So I'm actually going to start off with the cranial nerves here. So uh, this is looking at a sagittal section of the human head. Um, so, you know, uh, the sagittal section of our brain. Uh, so major parts here, there's the cerebrum, there's the cerebellum, this is the brain stem, which this is the midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata. Here's the diencephalon, so this is the thalamus, hypothalamus, there's the epithalamus, there's a corpus callosum, there's the pituitary gland. Okay, so let's move on uh, to looking at those cranial nerves, which I just mentioned. So cranial nerves are nerves that arise from the brain. Uh, we have 12 pairs of those cranial nerves, and they all arise from the brainstem, which is either the midbrain, pons, or the medulla oblongata. So let's go through these here. All right, so the first is the olfactory. So if we go to this picture here, we can see there's the olfactory nerves. Uh, they go through the, uh, the cryptiform plate and the ethmoid bone. Uh, and so you see this olfactory bulb when you take the brain off. So the olfactory uh, nerves give us our sensory for a sense of smell. Next are the optic nerves. Uh, these are sensory for vision. Uh, next here is the ocular motor nerve. It is a, uh, um, a motor nerve uh, and it does a few things. One of the things it does is it raises the eyelids. It also helps move the eyes. There are six um, uh, muscles that move the eyes, so this is going to be used in that. It also adjusts the amount of light entering the eyes uh, and also focuses the lenses. Uh, next uh, is the trochlear nerve. So you can see it coming off here and where it goes to on the eye there. It also is a motor nerve. It also helps move the eyes. Um, uh, next is the uh, trigeminal nerves. Uh, now the trigeminal nerve is a mixed nerve, so it's both motor and sensory. Uh, it is sensory on the face, scalp, and eyes, so you can see this area is where uh, it is sensory for. Uh, and it's motor in jaw movements, so all these movements I'm making right now with my jaw, that's, that's going through uh, the um, trigeminal. Uh, as you can see, oh, it is a fairly large nerve there. We go to the next one, this is the abducens. So you can see where it comes from there. The abducens is also motor, and it also helps move the eyes. Um, the next one is the facial. The facial is a mixed nerve. Uh, it is sensory uh, for taste on the back of the tongue. Uh, it is motor for facial expressions. That's how it gets its name. Uh, it also is motor for our lacrimal glands and also our salivary glands. All right. All right, so next is the vestibular cochlear nerve. You can see where it arises from. And it's called this because it goes to the vestibule, which is part of our inner ear, and also the cochlea, which is also part of our inner ear. So it's sensory for equilibrium, which is what we get from our vestibule, and also uh, for hearing, which is what we get from our cochlea. Uh, next is the glossopharyngeal. The glossopharyngeal is a mixed nerve. It's sensory on our pharynx, tonsils, and also on the tongue, so we get a sense of taste from it as well. It is motor on salivary glands and also used in swallowing. All right. Uh, next is the vagus nerve. You can see where it originates uh, from, and you can see all these things that our vagus nerve goes to, which is quite a lot. So it is mixed. It's motor on our larynx, so we use it when we're talking. Uh, and it's also motor for the viscera of the thoracic and a lot of the organs in the abdominal pelvic cavities. It's also sensory on the pharynx and larynx as well as the viscera of the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities. All right. Uh, next is the accessory. Uh, so this is motor for the soft palate, pharynx and larynx, as well as uh, neck and our upper back muscles. So you can see with the trapezius there. Lastly is the hypoglossal, um, so uh, hypo means below, glossal means tongue, so it innervates below the tongue, and this is motor for the tongue, so we use it for whatever we use our tongue for. All right, let's go to the uh, next part here, which deals with the meninges, ventricles, and cerebral spinal fluid. Now the men meninges we did cover back uh, in chapter 12, and they're the same things on the brain as they are on the, um, around the spinal cord. So we have the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater directly on the, uh, on the brain in this case. All right, so let's take a look at ventricles. Now, ventricles are internal chambers within the brain, 
And these uh, internal chambers are filled with cerebral spinal fluid. So each ventricle has what is known as a chord plexus. So if we go to this picture here, so uh, this is showing these ventricles here. This is the uh, first lateral ventricle, it's on the left side. The second lateral ventricle is on the right side. There's the third ventricle, and this is the fourth ventricle, okay? So each of these ventricles has what is known as a chorid plexus, which you can see here. And a chorid plexus is a network of blood capillaries that produces a cerebral spinal fluid, and that is through a filtration process. All right, so let's look at that cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, it is a clear, colorless fluid that is filtered from blood. Uh, it fills the ventricles and canals and uh, the spaces between the meninges. Everywhere where you see an arrow on this is where cerebral spinal fluid is found. Uh, and so look at its functions. One of its functions is just buoyancy. Uh, and our brain literally floats in our skull. So instead of our brain resting on our skull, uh, it's buoyant, it floats in there, all right? And this is a, a good function in that if our brain rested on our skull, the weight of the upper part of the brain would push down on those lower parts of the brain, uh, and actually we would kill those neurons in those lower areas there. Uh, it also serves in protection, and that is a shock displacer. So if you take a blow, uh, it will um, get displaced. One of the problems with that is if you take a blow to the head, is your brain's gonna move around uh, in, that, um, uh, in, in your skull there. So if you take a blow here, your brain's gonna actually recoil and hit the backside of your skull, which can cause some swelling in the meninges. Um, so uh, the cerebral spinal fluid also uh, allows us to have chemical stability. So it provides nutrients to the central nervous system and removes waste. Now, one thing I'm gonna mention here is the blood-brain barrier. Now, our, uh, our brain is only about 2% of our body mass. Uh, it's two to three pounds, depending on the person, that's the normal range. Uh, so it's like one to 2% of our body mass. However, it receives 25% of our blood and 20% of our body's oxygen and glucose. And so we talked about this, I kind of alluded to this uh, back in chapter 11 when I was talking about anytime we have a nerve impulse, sodium diffuses in, potassium diffuses out, and we have to pump sodium uh, back out of the cell and potassium back into the cell. And so anytime we have a nerve impulse, which you can think about the millions of times we have a nerve impulses uh, all the time, uh, we have to pump sodium out and pump potassium back into cells. That's gonna be very costly. So when you're talking about me, I weigh about 200 pounds, you know, uh, you know my brain two to three pounds, I'm looking at what, 1% to 1.5% of my body weight it's gonna use 20% of my daily uh, energy per day. Uh, and so uh, this idea that some people have talked about in the past where you know, that we only use 10% of our brain is just utter nonsense. We use all of our brain. Uh, our brain is much too costly to only use 10% of it. So uh, we look at the blood-brain barrier, which I was getting to, this is gonna prevent, and this is through you know, blood in our brain and so on, this prevents large substances from moving uh, from the blood into the cerebral spinal fluid. So this helps prevent like, you know, pathogens getting in there. But one of the problems with this is, is this can also prevent us getting medications into there as well. Uh, so if a pathogen does get in, it's really hard to get out afterwards.